Glad to welcome each and every one of you into Beulah Baptist Church this morning. It's so good to see so many here on this beautiful Sunday. And we hope we are all here for the same purpose, and that is to praise God and to look for his leadership and guidance in our lives. We have, uh, we have some visitors, it looks like, this morning, so we want you to, to uh, make a, a, an effort to get around and shake a few hands and see everybody. And, and if you are a visitor, we would ask that you would fill out the, the, uh, the guest registration that's in your, your bulletin. Um, I have uh, one announcement I'd like to make, and that is that the nominating committee will be meeting at Ginger and I, my house, uh, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. And I want each and every one of you to be in prayer for this, because this is a, a real important time in the life of our church. And this nominating committee is, is meeting, in, and like I said, it's been a while since we have met, and everyone has agreed to serve extra years on, on committees and terms and things. And, but we're looking at starting you know, the, the new Sunday school year in October, and so we need to um, find some people to serve on some of these committees, and some people are rotating off, and we're looking for to involve each and every one of you in the congregation in one way or another in serving the Lord. It, it, it just does us good for all of us to have a chance to serve in some capacity. So be in prayer for this. And when someone comes and maybe asks you that in the next week or two about serving on a particular committee, please give it some serious prayer and consideration because we really, each and every one of us needs to work together to bring us through this next phase in the life of our church. So be in prayer for that this week. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? Yes, Coral? Um, we'll be collecting school supplies in the library um, for the Cornerstone offering or ministry so y'all can be like to contribute in the library. Okay, now how, how long is this going to run? The month of August. For the month of August, okay. So keep that in mind, the whole month of August, if you want to be see some school supplies that you can pick up and want to contribute them to the local uh, cornerstone so they can be distributed bring them up and drop them off back in the library and, and you'll see that they get course we'll see that they get taken down and uh, delivered to them so keep that in mind any other announcements let's begin with an opening prayer our gracious heavenly father thank you so much that you've allowed us to come in your house this morning and we come father uh, with prayers for our loved ones we come with uh, prayers of praise for things that you've done in our lives father we we know you're watching over us each and every day we know you're in our lives and we see you working in our lives father but help us to be still and to listen and not get caught up in the hustle and bustle of the everyday life that, that surrounds each and every one of us. Help us to slow down enough to see where you would have us to go, Father. Help us to see the opportunities that you give us each day to minister in your name. Help us not to overlook someone who is sick or someone who is in need, Father. We're so thankful that you give us these opportunities, Father. And now, as we come into this worship service, Father, open our hearts to the message that's going to be brought to us this morning. May it instill in us the words of Jesus Christ and that we love one another and to spread this gospel throughout our country. And it's our country, Father, that definitely needs our prayers this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you will, join with me in our opening hymn this morning. It's hymn number 203. His name is Wonderful.
Uh, we're just very privileged this morning to have Dr. Gordon Fort with us this morning as our guest pastor this morning coming in. And um, as I look at his bio, you know, it's, it's gosh, he's really lived a, 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 an interesting life growing up in Africa and, and then having a chance to go back and minister there as, as some, a missionary and all. And it's definitely in a part of the world that needs a lot of our prayers and support. and. We're just very happy to, that he has come this morning and is going to uh, bring us the message. So if, welcome this morning, Dr. Ford. Thank you, Brother Let's bow in prayer together. <coughs> Father, this morning, it's good to be in your house together with the people of God, to know that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we can know a peace that passes all understanding. And today we're just delighted to be in your presence and we're asking for the work of your Holy Spirit this morning to help us understand your word, to help me preach your word, and to make your word clear to each one of us. We thank you for each person who's here today. We pray for each person who may have a special need in their life for you to intervene in a special way. And we're asking you that from the windows of heaven, you would pour out a blessing on us this morning and that each of us would be encouraged and refreshed from having been in your presence today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Want us to stand together for the offertory? Faith of our fathers. Singing Faith of Our Fathers 352 should be in your bulletin. pray for our offertory. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and grace. We thank you for these brothers who have come to help us in taking up the offering today, and we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us now. We pray for each person that you would bless us as we give from the riches that you've entrusted to us as your stewards. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
My wife, uh, Leanne, is here with me, and so thankful that she could come and go. Uh, we have four children that were uh, born in Africa. Uh, we went out as missionaries 1985. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before that, I was a pastor of a rural church in Texas for 10 years. I began when I was a 19-year-old college student. I didn't know much, but I was enthusiastic. Uh, one of the ladies in the church, uh, when I was called to be their pastor, voted for me because I had a good haircut. So that was the high bar I had to jump over to be the pastor of the Macedonia Hicks Baptist Church. And it was a rural church. Uh, most of our church members were bivocational farmers and ranchers. And uh, that's where I learned uh, to preach. And they were very, very kind to me and overlooked a lot of my mistakes. And um, so coming out here today, uh, I wasn't expecting to find a Starbucks or a mall and uh, was very happy to not find those things on my way out here. And to go through the farmlands uh, has just been a real blessing to me this morning and to be able to come this morning and share the word with you is a real privilege. So thank you for this privilege, Brother Buddy. You and Miss Ginger, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, to keep things going. And uh, this morning, if you have your Bible, we'll be looking at James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. This is what the text says. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. <clears throat> Country church that I pastored, we were very traditional. And uh, much like we just did, um, when we had the offertory, about my second Sunday at the church, uh, we had two deacons. About 20 people in the church had two deacons. And uh, one was the senior deacon, Mr. Touchstone. Mr. Touchstone and uh, the other deacon came forward, being the, you know, unfamiliar uh, with the system pastor. I called on Mr. Touchstone to pray for the offertory. And what followed was one of the most interesting prayers I've ever heard. First of all, it uh, took a while to decipher what he was saying. Uh, it became quite clear to me in the course of his prayer that this was not something that he was used to doing. And uh, finally, he kind of mumbled and fumbled and finally got through with it. And uh, they went back and sat down. And on the front row, we had about three or four youth and one of them named Donald Valenta was sitting there and he had tears running down his cheeks. Now his, uh, I was a single preacher. So I don't know if you've ever had a single pastor, but every farm or family in the community was trying to help me out. And uh, I often got invited to Sunday lunch to get to meet so-and-so, you know. And Mrs. Valenta that day uh, was one of the widow ladies in the church, had uh, five kids and she invited me to come to lunch, and this was the home of Donald Valenta. So while we were getting ready for, for lunch, I said, well, Donald, what were, you, what were you crying about in church? Donald said, Brother Gordon, I've been going to this church all my life. I've known Mr. Bitt all my life, Mr. Touchstone. And he said, that's the first time I've ever heard him pray in public. Another Sunday, I called on the husband of the church secretary, Mr. Frank. His wife, Miss Bernice, was Miss Baptist everything. She kept the church in line, let everyone know what the Baptist doctrine was. She knew about every Baptist tradition there was to know. And uh, she had been church secretary long as anyone could remember. So I thought, well, I should be safe calling on Miss Bernice's husband to pray. So I said, Mr. Frank, would you open us with a word of prayer? Mr. Frank looked at me, and he didn't say a word. He never really said much in church. He didn't say a word. He just looked straight over at Miss Bernice, just did this, and Miss Bernice prayed. 
Mr. Frank, he didn't pray in public. Now, let me ask you a question. Where did you learn how to pray? Where did you learn the words of prayer? Uh, I was born in Africa to missionary parents. My mom and dad were both doctors, mom a pediatrician, my dad a GP, went out to Africa in 1952. And uh, my mom and daddy, when we'd go to bed at night, one of them would usually come and pray with us before we went to sleep. Every time we had a meal, my dad would always insist that we'd have a prayer time. In fact, when we would be in the States visiting our family, my mama was from Louisiana, eldest of seven girls. Uh, mama's sisters didn't go to church like she thought they ought to. And so because they were the visiting missionaries, guess who got called on to pray for the meal? My dad. And I just want you all to know, by the time he got through praying, that food was cold. <laughs> Because he would preach in his prayer. You know, he'd be telling the Lord about how he needed to work in the lives of these sisters. And I mean, now this, my wife occasionally will have a, a Jehovah's Witness come to our porch and knock on the door. And my wife will not let them go till she prays with them. And what do you think she's doing while she's praying, right? She's getting her two words in edgewise while their head is bowed and their eyes are closed and they can't say nothing. They got to listen to you. And so she's praying the preaching this prayer you ever heard. Now, where did you learn how to pray? Who taught you to pray? What I've learned in these last years, we came back from Africa about 16 years ago to work at the International Mission Board. And part of my responsibility has been to travel around the United States to churches and our seminaries and universities and just tell them what God is doing in Africa and around the world. And as I've been in churches, big and small, rural, urban, it's become very clear to me that by and large, we as the church have lost the doctrine and the practice of prayer. Here's what I mean. I've been in churches where, you know, they'll have an opening prayer, call on someone to pray. And while that person's praying, from the side comes the choir during the prayer. While everyone's head's bowed and everybody's eyes are closed, the choir makes their way in. And the musicians come in and they all, if they have a little praise team, they get on the platform and they all get their mics and they're all getting ready, getting their last little sip of water. And then when the guy says, amen, we all look up and we're, wow, look at there. Where did they come from? What did we use the prayer for? Just a transition. We use that prayer as a segue as a way to bring the people out onto the platform without any of us looking, to kind of smooth the service out. But now let me ask you a question. When we pray, who are we talking to? Now, do you believe that God is all-powerful? I do. Why do I believe that? Well, just driving out here today, I saw a lot of evidence of it. He spoke a word and this creation came into existence. It was no trouble for him. He spoke a word and all these animals that you see were formed. The birds of the air. And God does things in such a way that he didn't make the birds before he made the air for them to fly in. He does everything in exact order with exact specificity. He's a God who has a design in everything. He's the great designer. See the sun rise and the sunset. See the moon reflecting the glory of the sun. And you see the God of creation who's all powerful, demonstrated every day. He's all powerful. He also knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. He was here before you ever got here. Now I know some people, as you probably do, who think they know everything. And they're very happy to tell you about it. But I got news for them. There's a God of the universe who knows everything. And he sees everything. There's nothing on this planet that he doesn't see. But you know, it's interesting, isn't it? When do criminals like to do their, uh, their work? 
in the cover of darkness. Why? So no one will see him. Well, guess what? God's presence, the darkness, is, is the brightest noonday sun. He sees everything. There's nothing you've done this week that he doesn't know about. There's no thought you've thought that he doesn't know about. There's no motive behind anything you've done this week that he doesn't know about. There's nothing you said that he hasn't heard. There's nothing you've looked at that he hasn't seen. He knows and sees everything. Have you ever been out in a total eclipse? Leanne and I happened to be in sub-Saharan Africa during a total eclipse, and uh, we went out from the capital city of Harare out into the hill country, and we were up on some rocky mountains to watch this total eclipse. Now, what is the warning that you hear over and over again before a total eclipse? What do they say? Don't look at it. Don't look at it. But, you know, if it's a total eclipse, why not? I mean, that means that the moon is completely covering the sun, right? That's a total eclipse. So why can't you look at it? Because just one little bitty ray coming around that moon and heading for the earth strikes your retina and can burn it out. I ask you a question. That little bitty ray burn out your eyesight from 950 million miles away? Why in the world would you casually walk into the presence of this God? When we pray, we're calling on the God of the universe. That's who we're talking to. That's who has invited you to come for an audience. Now let me ask you something. If it's true that He can do everything, He can see everything, and He knows everything, have you got somebody better you want to talk to? You ever thought to yourself, you know what, if I could just get so-and-so on my side, I could get this done. If I could just talk to so-and-so, I could get over this problem. If I just knew so-and-so, uh, I could get the resources I need to get this job done. And brothers and sisters, we're bypassing the greatest resource you ever had in your life if you're a child of God. The God of the universe is firmly fixed in the heavens. He hadn't gone anywhere. I checked in with him this morning. And history is running right on time. It's right on schedule. He is never early and he's never late. He's always exactly on time. And brothers and sisters, today, his creation in this universe where we're living in, it's right on schedule. He knows everything, he sees everything, knows everything that's going on, and he's invited us to pray. Now, in this context, James is writing a statement about the prophet Elijah. Elijah was a prophet who prayed, and he asked God to shut the heavens so the rains wouldn't fall. And God shut the heavens for three years and six months. Those people out in California are having a pretty tough time with this drought, aren't they? Can you imagine not a drop of rain for three years and six months, what that'd be like? And then it says, Elijah then prayed again, and God opened the heavens, and the heavens gave their rain. And then he makes the statement, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much as though what he's saying to us in the church this morning is if Elijah had been in here, except for his gender, that he was a male, he could have been any man in this room. He could have been one of you guys right up there. He could have been Elijah sitting up in the balcony. There wasn't a big halo over his head everywhere he walked that said, this is the holy man of God. There wasn't some big light shining from heaven every time Elijah went out to take a tour that declared he's the great prophet of God. No, the scripture is so clear about this. He was flesh and blood just like you, just like me. But when he prayed, something happened. So that's why I asked the question, if you have your bulletin, so how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Are you a person of prayer? Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you practice praying? 
Now, you might think, well, Brother Gordon, I appreciate that encouragement. You know, that's a decision that's kind of up to me, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. Because the Bible is very clear about this in the New Testament. We are commanded to pray. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 1 Thessalonians says to pray without ceasing. In fact, in Galatians, when you look at the whole armor of God, and I had my son, I have a, a one boy and three girls. I had my son, when we were in Botswana, I was going out to a rural village where we had started a new church, and I wanted my son to quote the whole armor of God. So he'd been memorizing it all week. And, and my son Giles, I mean, he said it perfectly. But you know what? I left out the most important part of the text that deals with the whole armor of God. Because the last part of the whole armor of God, once you put it all on, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, once you put it on, shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel, breastplate of righteousness, once you put all of this whole armor on, at the end of it says, Always in prayer on every occasion. It closes it up with saying, once you get this whole armor on, that's not good enough. You want to be in a spirit of prayer as you wear that armor. So friends, prayer is not God's suggestion for us. He's not saying this is a good idea if you feel like it. He's saying, I want you to pray. So what is this thing called prayer? It's not complicated. You know, uh, sometimes um, people take simple things and make them very complicated. But this is not complicated. Because prayer in its essence is simply communication with God. It's, it's sharing information with God and Him sharing information with us. That's what prayer is. It's talking to God and allowing God to talk to us. That's what prayer is. It's communication with God. Now, if He knows everything, sees everything, can do anything, do you think He can communicate with us? Uh, I was in a church one time, and they had an orchestra up in front. And um, it was this high school orchestra. And I was in Romans chapter 1. I wanted to demonstrate the word keruso, which means to herald the gospel. means to preach the gospel. And it's the word keruso, which was a New Testament word for blow a trumpet. So there was a guy up here in the orchestra with the trumpet, two guys in the orchestra section. So I asked these two high school boys, I said, hey boys, would you mind pick your trumpet up? I want to demonstrate this point. So I want you to blow me a note. I don't care what note it is, just, just turn loose with one. So the one guy, I startled him, you know, and the guy got up and he came to the front and he blows, he goes, beep. <laughs> I said, what? That is pitiful. I said, I want to see some blood vessels popping out up here. Come on. So now, I mean, he turns loose. I mean, he really cut loose. After church, I was out in the foyer greeting folks as they were leaving. And this, uh, two, these two ladies walked up to me. They were sisters. And this one came up and introduced herself, said, Brother Gordon, you about gave me a heart attack. I said, why? She said, we got the bulletin from the church this week, and I saw that we were going to have this speaker who's been a missionary and said, I called sister who was standing with her. I called sister, and we were talking about it. And I told my sister, I said, sister, there is no way I would ever consider a call to missions. If God wanted me to be a missionary, he would have to make it so clear it was like a trumpet blast. Oh, you don't think God can make stuff clear to you? Oh, he can make it clear. You know, oftentimes as pastor, people come want my counsel. And generally, what I found out is they already knew what they should do. They already knew what they should do. You know why they came to talk to me? Because they hoped I'd tell them something different. Right? I learned very quickly when someone would ask my counsel to ask them this question, who else are you talk to about this? Because you know what they were doing? 
They'd talk to this one, talk to this one, talk to this one, until they got the answer they wanted. Oh, they already knew. And friends, I'm telling you, when God wants to make something clear to us, oh, it's not hard for Him. But are you listening? But you see, He's not going to waste His time making something clear to you that you don't intend to do. Why would He do that? If you don't have a heart that says, God, if you'll show me, I'll obey. If you'll give me the direction, I'll follow. If you show me my purpose, I'll surrender. If your heart is not in that position, why would he show you? Because now he puts you at jeopardy. There's no worse place for you and I as believers to be than in a place of disobedience. No worse place to be. Because when we disobey God, now, now all the bets are off. We place ourselves in a position where the adversary, Satan, has free reign to attack us. We have, we have no hope. Why would we want to do that? Prayer is the tool that God uses to keep us on track. It's the tool that God uses to hear and answer your request. Now, you have a, a very good point if you're thinking, Brother Gordon, but doesn't God know everything? Doesn't He already know what I need? Why should I ask Him? If He already knows, and He's going to do it anyway, why, why do I need to talk to Him about it? That's a great question. You know why we ought to? Because James 1 says, you have not because you ask not. You see, God loves it when His children ask Him. He loves it. You know what? He can always say no. That's not good for you. I'm, not, I'm very thankful from this position in my life to look back and say, God, thank you for not answering that prayer request I made in the way I asked it. Because now I know with years of experience, I wasn't asking for a good thing. This week, my wife and I have... Uh, Four grandbabies, one on the way, about to be born. In fact, uh, this week we're going to Birmingham, Alabama, where I'll let Leanne stay with our eldest daughter, who's an OBGYN doctor, uh, for the birth of, our, of her third baby. Uh, her, her firstborn is uh, Josiah's five, turning six. Josiah, our grandson, has me on the phone. He says, Papa... Could you give me a million dollars? I want to buy some Lego and a TV for my room. <laughs> Guess what I told him? I didn't say no, but I'm going to have to have a little chat with that boy this weekend and help him understand his papa don't have a million dollars to give him. But now, brothers and sisters, when you come to the God of the universe, does he have a million dollars? Oh, he sure does. He's got more than that. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I was in a little country church in Louisiana. Um, they had given a wonderful Lottie Moon offering. Someone said, hey, Brother Gordon, would you mind go to Louisiana and just go visit that church and thank them? So I, that's what I was there for. Stayed in, out in the country in a farmhouse with a farmer and his wife. I came home in about a week or two later. I had come home from work and Leanne met me at the door. She said, you need to go in there and see what's in that envelope on our counter. She said, I thought it was junk mail. I about threw it away. I go in there, here's this little hand-addressed little envelope to, to me. And inside is a little note that says, Brother Gordon, thank you for coming to our little church. And said, uh, can you help me make sure this check gets to the right people at the International Mission Board uh, for missions? Love flow. One million dollar check. With my name on the byline. I tried to negotiate with the IMB for a percentage, but for some reason they weren't having it. A million dollars. Listen, God can do anything. 
There's nothing too hard for him. When it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, it means exactly that. Effectual means when you pray, something happens. That's what effectual means. The effectual fervent prayer is just, it's one Greek word, and it means it's like if you ever pour vinegar on nitre, uh, you see this swirling, frothy mass. Well, that, that is effectual fervent. That's what that word means. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We had a missionary in uh, East Asia, China, who had a statement. She, she would say, prayer works Prayer is work, prayer leads to work. Prayer works, prayer is work, prayer leads to work. In Acts chapter 12, uh, oh, Peter's been thrown into prison. Herod the Tetrarch has already killed James, the brother of John, and he saw that that made everybody happy, so he said, well, I'll just get me another one, and he took Peter and put him into prison, intending to do the same thing, but it was the season of Passover, so he had to wait to not offend the Jewish custom. But as Passover was about to conclude, he intended to bring Peter out and take him down and have him killed. And it says in the text that the church was meeting in the uh, home of, the, of Mary, the mother of John Mark, and they were praying fervently. All over that city, wherever those early Christians were gathered, they were praying for Peter. This was a dangerous time for this fledgling church facing great persecution and opposition. And so as they're praying fervently for God to intervene and save Peter's life, somewhere in the night... An angel appears in the jail cell where he is, and the chains that are on him fall off. He's between two Roman soldiers. The chains fall off. The angel kind of bumps him to wake him up and says, put your cloak on, uh, let's go. He thinks he's having a dream. So he, he, you know, he's describing what happens. He says, I get up and I go to the door. Door opens. I go out. And the jailers are outside the door. The other two Roman soldiers, they don't do anything. I walk down the hallway, go out the outside. And then it says, when he gets out into the open air, he feels a night breeze, and he suddenly realizes, no, this is a jailbreak. This is really happening. And the angel, he follows this angel. He goes to the old city of Jerusalem, and the iron gate is the closest gate into the old city, and it says it opens of its own accord. He walks through with the angel, gets on the other side, goes several streets, and then the angel leaves him. And he's standing there. So he knows he's not far from the house of John Mark and, and his mom Mary. So he makes his way to the home of John Mark. And he's knocking on the door. And what's happening inside? There's a prayer meeting. It says the church is praying fervently for him. So he knocks on the door, interrupts the prayer meeting. And a young woman named Rhoda comes to the door and says, Who is it? And he says, It's me, Peter. And she recognizes his voice. And she's in shock. She's shocked. She doesn't open the door. She doesn't even wait to open the door. She turns around. She runs back to the prayer meeting. She goes into the room where prayer is taking place and says, Hey, hey, Peter's at the door. And what did they say? Shut up, woman. We're praying. You read it. It says, No, it can't be him. It must be his ghost. That's what they said. They didn't believe her. Poor Peter. He's still at the door knocking. Finally, they get convinced, come out, go to the door. Who is it? Peter opened the door. They're all shocked. Here's Peter. And uh, he comes in, to close the door, and he tells them what's happened. This amazing, incredible story of what has just taken place. They're all astonished, and I can just see it in my mind's eye. One of those Christians looking around going, it works. Prayer works. You know... If you had a drought and you called the people in this church to come down here for prayer meeting to pray for rain, how many of us would bring an umbrella? Do we pray with expectancy? Do you really believe that when I pray, something will happen? And that's what happened to this New Testament church. As they begin to experience prayer, they begin to realize, wait a minute. When Jesus was telling us about prayer, 
When they came to him, his disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. And Jesus taught them how to pray. The most common prayer that Christians know all over the world is the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus was teaching them how to pray. And as they were learning how to pray, they began to discover that when we pray, something happens. And friends, there's nothing like walking with God in prayer and discovering His answers to prayer to encourage your prayer life. Uh, I tell you, prayer works. One time in church, one Sunday morning at this country church, I pastored. Blevins Bundy was a bivocational rancher. He was a cattle buyer. And O'Blevins was a, just rough and tumble. He loved John Wayne. Boy, he loved John Wayne cowboy movies. But old Blevins, uh, he never said two words in church. One Sunday morning, he, he, I said, anyone have a testimony you'd like to share? And Blevins put his hand up. Well, he gets up and he says, he said, I want to tell you all something happened this week. He said, I was out trying to load two Bramer bulls, as they'd say in Texas, Brahman bulls, two Bramer bulls. He said, I was trying to load two Bramer bulls. I was all by myself. And he said, I'd pull the trailer up. And he said, I was going around the pen, struggling. Finally, I got one bull to load in the middle trailer. Got the gate shut on him. Then I took the trailer and I backed it up to try to get that bull in the back. And he said, that old bull, he had just walked past that ramp and he'd just snort and shake his head and he'd run and snort and shake his head. And he said, I was frustrated. And beside that, Blevin said, I look up and in the north there's a blue norther coming. It's fixing to start raining and temperature's fixing to drop and get freezing. And he said, I don't know what to do. And it's starting to get dark. And he said, so, folks, he said, the only thing I knew to do was just to, to kneel down and pray. He said, so? He said, I knelt down in the, in the cow pen. And, he, and, and I'll tell you, he was choked up. He said, and I prayed. I said, Lord, if you could just help me today get this Brahma bull loaded, I sure would appreciate it. He said, I got up. He said, I walked toward that Brahma bull. He said, it walked straight over to that ramp and turned around and backed up into the trailer. Now, I'm telling you, that is exactly what he said. Now, you can believe it or not, but I'm telling you, that old guy was crying when he told that testimony. You see, if that Brahma bull had walked straight over there and gone front ways up, later old Blevins could have said, well, well, you know, he could have probably explained it away. But in that church full of cowmen, he gave that testimony. Every person in there knew if that happened the way he said it and he was broken crying when he told it, the only way that happened is, is God did it. You think there's anything too small in your life for God to pay attention to it? Anything too small that would You'd say, well, you know, that's just not important enough. There's another, uh, this is on Wednesday night prayer meeting. We were having a prayer meeting. And I was reading about prayer, and I'm a young preacher trying to learn about how to, how to pastor and how to live the Christian life. And I'm learning about prayer myself, you know. And we're trying to learn and practice what we're reading, encourage one another. And uh, this Wednesday night, Dolly and Ray was sitting in the church with her little baby girl, Elizabeth, who was about seven years old, seven or eight. So I asked for prayer requests. Elizabeth put her hand up, little eight-year-old. And her mama tried to pull it down, you know, because she was embarrassed. She said, what's she going to say? What's she going to say? You know, she's Elizabeth. And I said, so I said, no, no, darling. Uh, let, let Elizabeth share a prayer request. So Elizabeth said, Brother Gordon, I want us to pray for Fluffy. Now, Fluffy was her cat. She said, Fluffy's been gone for three days, and I don't know where she is. Maybe a coyote got her or something it ate her, but... Would you just pray for Fluffy? Well, you know, I was in a bit of a dilemma now. Mr. Preacher, what you going to do? I never prayed for a cat before. 
So I, I, I kind of paused for a second, and I could tell Darlene was a little nervous. But I thought, well, Lord, you know, it's important to her. If it's important to her, it's important to you. I'm just going to pray, let you, let you deal with it. See, that's the great thing about prayer. It's not up to me, is it? No. I'm handing it over to the God of the universe who knows what's best, wants to do what's best, loves to do what's best, and let him handle it. So I prayed, Lord, you know where Fluffy is. If, if it just please you to bring old Fluffy home, that'd just be great. That night, we had a party line. About 15 minutes after church was over, Darlene and her family lived back in the woods in the trailer house, and she called me on the party line. I mean, excited. I said, Brother Gordon, you're not going to believe it. I said, I was, we're going home in the truck. I said, when I turned down the lane to go to the house, when I turned, the, the headlights hit our front porch. Fluffy was sitting at the door. <laughs> what do you think about that? That's just a coincidence. Then I wish you could have been there that Christmas, on Christmas Eve, when Elizabeth went into the kitchen and said, Mama, I want us to pray for a little snow. Central Texas, December, snow, I don't think so. Darlene, her mama, is trying to figure out what to do. She told me this later. She said, how am I going to explain to my little girl when she's disappointed? And she's trying to figure out how to do it. So all she knew to do was just to go ahead and pray, and she let Elizabeth pray. So Elizabeth just said, Lord, if it just... Please you to send us a little snow tonight for Christmas. I sure would appreciate it. And prayed the sweetest little prayer Darlene said and said amen. And then Darlene went and tucked her into bed. And Darlene told me she couldn't sleep. She was just turning and tossing, worried about how she's going to explain this. What's she going to say? And it, she said about four in the morning, she just finally got up, made coffee, and she goes into, uh, you know, into her little kitchen area and looks out the window. And it snowed. <laughs> Do you believe it makes any difference when you pray? Because here's the thing. You do what you believe. Everything else is just religious talk. If I ask a question amongst most believers, Christians, do you think prayer is important? They'll all say, yes, it's important. Prayer is important. But if I ask it this way, if I said to you this morning, for you, is prayer essential? Now, that's a different question. Is prayer essential to you? Because what that means is you can't live without it. You know that your life depends on it. How I live today matters. If I want my life to count today, I better be a praying person because I want to hear what God wants to say. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to be where God wants me to be. And if I'm not talking with Him, if I'm not reading His Word and hearing from God, I won't know. It's not just important, it is essential. And when God says to you, you have not because you didn't ask me, that means that God is waiting for us to talk to Him about things that we want Him to do. And that there are times when God would love to do something for you, but you haven't asked Him. This is the challenge of our American culture. Amen. We, we just hate to ask, right? If I can't fix it, I mean, i got to be desperate before I'm going to come to you and say, Brother, i got something going on. I just can't do it myself. Would you mind helping me? And that's the hardest thing for us to do. But brothers and sisters, God loves to answer your prayer. He loves to. When you ask Him, He loves to show you that He is your heavenly Father, that He loves you and cares about you, wants what's best for you. He loves to do that. He wants you to know Him. 
He doesn't want to be some distant figure. You know, most of us, if we're honest, the way we use prayer, it's like a spare wheel of a car. That's when we use it. When do you look for your spare tire? When you got a flat. When something's gone wrong. Now you need it. Uh, you, you don't want to use prayer like that. You want prayer. When it says to pray without ceasing, that means that I'm walking with God in such a way that there's no hindrance between the Spirit of God and myself, and He can mold me, make me, shape me, move me, speak to me, lead me, prompt me, stop me, exhort me whenever He wants to, and I'm listening to Him and having a conversation with Him. I want to encourage you in your prayer life. Because it works. Prayer works. But it is work. It's hard work. You really get down to pray. Listen, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Prayer is hard work. Don't think about prayer as something real easy. Oh, I just, I'll pray when I feel like it. No, because you'll never feel like it. It's hard work. It takes energy to pray. To get in the presence of God and to hear from Him and to pray. I mean, Jesus agonized in prayer and shed drops of blood. This is not something that's easy to do. It's natural to do. It should be natural to do, but it's hard work. That's what I want you to hear from me. It works. It is hard work, but it also leads to work. Man, God takes your prayer, and then He begins to shape you and take you on a journey with Him, and you never know what He'll do. So I want to encourage you in your prayer life. So how's your prayer life? Uh, in closing, before um, I have a word of prayer here, as I've kind of myself in my spiritual pilgrimage ask the Lord to teach me to pray. I, I would, that's something I'd encourage you to do. Is in the morning when you wake up, just say, Lord, would you teach me how to pray? I want to be an effective prayer. When I pray, I want to know something's happening. Would you teach me how to do that? And see what the Lord does, because that's exactly what the disciples did. They came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Ask Him. Teach me how to pray. Here's some other things that I've learned. As far as is possible, set a time and a place to pray. Now, that's not easy. I've laughed. You know what social media has done for us? Facebook and all these other Twitter and TikTok and all stuff I don't even know what they do, you know? You know what it's taught us? We actually did have time to pray. We actually did have time to pray. Oh, make a time and a place to pray. Set aside a time and a place to pray. If you've got to get up five minutes earlier, get up five minutes early. Whatever it takes, you set a time and place to pray. Sometimes uh, we need to get quiet. Get to a place and don't make any noise. Just be quiet. Our culture is winding us up so tight, we are, we're just full of white noise in our brains. And, and we need to practice solitude and silence. You need to get to a place and just get quiet because it's in the quiet you'll hear the voice of God. Live in His presence. Practice the presence of God. He's with you anyway. Are you aware that He's with you? Practice His presence. If you know some lost people, pray for them by name. Last uh, week before last, a guy that we've been praying for, his dad, uh, lost man, he was, uh, he was an alcoholic, a bipolar, gambler. He divorced his mom when he was about 12 years old. And this, this young man has taken care of his dad all of his adult life, basically. And his dad is so lost. And his dad was really, really rough and mean to him growing up. But, but old Sebastian was praying for his dad's salvation, asked me to join him in prayer. And two weeks ago, his dad is uh, in Chippenham Hospital and in hospice care, about to pass away. And uh, he's had a stroke and was kind of dopey, didn't know anybody, but Sebastian had been praying for him. And he said, two weeks ago, Sebastian texted me and he said, I went to see dad today. And he said, when I went into the room, he woke up and he was perfectly alert. He said, I had six hours with him and I got to share the gospel with him. And my daddy prayed to receive Christ. Listen, pray for the lost by name. Maybe you've got loved ones that are lost or rebellious. Pray for them by name. 
Pray for your family and friends. Pray for the advance of the kingdom. Lastly, consider starting a prayer journal. I have one that I started about six years ago in which I just record. I'm praying for this and asking God to do something. Or there's something going on that I'm praying about and I just record it in a journal. Because what I want is to see it when God answers it. I want to put a date there when God answers something specifically. I want to put a date because it becomes your testimony. When you pray and you see God work, it encourages your faith. I just encourage you to write your prayer request down and say, God, on this date I was praying for this. I'm waiting for you to answer it. And then keep a record of it and see what God does. All right? Now let me have a word of prayer together, and then we're going to close with the old rugged cross, hymn number 141. And I think it's uh, in your bulletin, right? Let's close with prayer. Why don't you just stand with me as we're preparing to have the invitation and have this uh, hymn and close. And just down in your heart now, as you're praying, as we're about to wrap up and head home. If you want a personal response this morning, my encouragement to you would be just that very simple request of the Lord. Teach me to pray. Maybe you've been a praying person for a long time. Maybe you practice prayer. You're, you believe it, you practice it, you live it. Then I want to encourage you to bear down in prayer in this day and time. There's things going on that only God can fix. And we need Him. But if it's something in your life you've never known much about it, no one ever really taught you anything about it, no one ever showed you how to pray, no one ever took you to the Scripture and said, here's some things in the Word of God that are principles of prayer that you need to learn, then I want to encourage you just to pray that very simple prayer. Lord, teach me to pray. And so, Father, this morning now as we come to the time of benediction and we sing this hymn, would you just encourage our hearts? Would you open us to your word and just let it strengthen us and bless us? Let it find its way into the soil of our souls. And then let us just put into practice whatever you show us, whatever the need is in the room, however you speak to us in this room. When we leave this place, would you just give us the strength, determination, and courage to make the decisions that you've laid on our hearts today and to live and walk in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's sing the old rugged cross as we close our service today. Hymn number 
as we close today, my encouragement to you is that as you leave this place, that the hand of the Lord would rest on you, that you would receive his blessing, and that this week you walk in his presence, that your hands would be hands of healing. You know, people are hurting around us, and we have hands that can help. That your feet would walk on the highways of God's holiness, that you would walk in the paths of his righteousness every day of this week. That your ears would just be paying attention to the voice of God, hearing what he wants to say to you. And that your own words would be good, salt, that would heal. And that your life would be a light to those who walk in darkness. Because they need to see that light. And may God's hand of blessing just rest on you every day this week until you come back together. You be blessed in this life. Let's be blessed. Thank you very much.